Hey everybody, I'm David Bach. I could not be more excited to be back here with you. I have my friend Lewis Howes in the house, buddy. It is my really man. good. It's good. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but I'm putting a high five up to the screen because I say in the house, Lewis and I are doing this over Zoom. When Lewis and I were together back in 2019, um, I was in his studio doing a podcast for the launching of the Latte Factor. And you and I did a high five that like people have stopped me on the street in the past. They're like, that Lewis House podcast was so amazing. And when the two of you high fived, I could just feel the electricity between uh, the two yeah. of you. Boom. And so high five through the screen. <laughs> um, I'm just, uh, first of all, I appreciate you asking me to do this interview with you because I want my listeners and as many people as possible to get your book in their hands. We're, we're going to be talking about a brand new book that Lewis has got coming out. It's called The Greatness Mindset. Unlock the power of your mind and live your best life today. It is such a good book. I, I, I read the, I got up today at six o'clock in the morning. I meditated and I read this book again, cover to cover. Um, it is not a, a quick self-help cliche book. This is a deep, meaningful guide on, I believe, truly how to go deep inside and figure out how to live your best life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, before I jump in here, I have so many questions for you, Lewis. I have six pages of questions I took. Um, give so For people who may not know you, I just want to brag about you here for a second. Give people your bio because um, it's insane. So Lewis is, you know, a New York Times bestselling author. He's written The School of Greatness. Uh, the Mask of Masculinity. He's a well-known keynote speaker, an industrial leading show host. His host, the School of Greatness, which I was on, he has done a staggering tw over 1,200 times. That's 1,200 deep, meaningful interviews with some of the greatest legends of our lifetime. Um, I just started making a list of people just from your website, Kobe Bryant, Brene Brown, Tony Robbins, Mark Hyman, Mel Robbins, Joe Dispenza, James Clear, Jay Shetty. These are just the people I was recognizing on the front of your website. You've interviewed everybody. You've got 8 million social media followers. No, actually now it shows 11 million social media followers, 10 million monthly views, 7 million monthly podcast downloads it's really i mean honestly it's it's staggering right like i i think that these numbers sometimes get lost because they're so big and i was looking up today online how many podcasts make a good podcast and and th this is an interesting stat i don't even know if you know this lewis but check out this stat for a second if you have 123 downloads on a podcast you're in the top 50% of podcasts. Wow. 123, po 123 downloads. If you have 3,400 downloads, you're in the top 10%. If you have 9,000 downloads in a month of doing your podcast, you're in the top 5%. You've got 7 million monthly downloads with over half a billion downloads now. Did you ever imagine <clears throat> when you started trying to like learn how to have a better life mm. that you that this would happen like i mean i think i i just didn't know how it could happen i just thought it was such a big thing to, to dream and think of uh in my first year i only got seven hundred fifty thousand total downloads going an episode every week going all in like just doing everything i could to get it out there in the world so this was 10 years ago last week was my 10-year anniversary of the show um <clears throat> and it's just been a it's been a testament of the power of consistency, not the power of being smart or intelligent or better than other people, but just the power of like, I have a very clear mission that I've set out, which is to serve and impact 100 million lives weekly to help them improve the quality of their life. So I'm very clear on the meaningful mission that I have. And I show up every week and I deliver. And it's not always great and it's not always good sometimes, but I show up consistently and I try to say, how can I make this time a little bit better than the last time? How can I get feedback to improve? How can I improve my skills? And how can I be a better listener to serve my audience? And so I think anytime you do something for 10 years, every single week with the intention of improving, 
hopefully the thing you're doing gets better. So there's already he's Lewis has already dropped a ton of nuggets that are in the book. One of them was meaningful mission. And and he just laid out his meaningful mission. And we will go into that because you lay out in this in this book everything about like how do you find your meaningful mission? What how do you write your meaningful mission out? It gives me the chills. So um all right. I, again, I'm going to I'm going to start actually at the end of the book for a second, which is not okay. what people normally do. Before I do, though, I want to give out the website in the beginning of the podcast for people to go get the book. The book is The Greatness Mindset. Unlock the power of your mind and live your best life today by Lewis Howes. What website do you want them to go to to get the book today? Oh, they can just go to, um, you know, Amazon and get it there, or Barnes and Noble, or if they go to lewishouse.com slash bundle, they'll see options to buy the book there. Okay, fantastic. Lewis Howes dot com backslash bundle so it, it, at the very end of, and i want everybody to get this book you got to read this book it's this is going to be an incredible journey for you to take and we're going to give you a lot in this podcast but i want you to get the book too because this is like a master's class in this is what's not actually taught in school this is this is, this, I, is, this is this is this is what i wish i learned growing up this is what i wish yeah. i had 10 15 20 years ago when i was struggling and suffering this is the book that i wish i had Five years ago, this is what book I wish. And I'm glad that I have now, to be honest. It's everything I wish I could have. And so I went out and, and seeked it. And I said, how can I simplify all these things? Because I got to interview all these neuroscientists and therapists and, you know, incredible individuals on achieving greatness, but also feeling fulfilled on their journey, not just having success and zero fulfillment, but achieving greatness while having fulfillment and joy and feeling loved and worthy. And I wanted to say, how can I simplify this? Because it's so hard for so many people, including myself for so long. How can I understand it if I was 10, if I was 20, if I was 30 again? How could I understand it from that perspective, from that age range, from that breakdown that I had, from that stuckness that I was in? How could I make it so simple for myself to say, all I got to do is just, <clears throat> it's hard work, but how can I simplify the process? And that's what I was trying to create. Well, and again, you you know, when when you when you say you've done twelve hundred interviews, I was thinking about the amount of hours you've spent on this journey. How many hours do you think you first of all, when you do a podcast interview typically, like I've spent 10 hours a day prepping for this interview, right? Because I read your book cover <laughs> to cover. I took six pages of notes, I went through what you guys sent me. I actually prep for my podcast. I know everybody doesn't, but yeah. I know that you do. So like how much time would you say that you've spent studying greatness in the last 10 years? You've been doing this for 14 years. The podcast has been going for 10 yep. years. How many hours do you think you've put in? Man. Well, I, I do three episodes a week that I post. I do between four and six interviews a week, and they're roughly an hour and a half to two hours long. So I don't know, do the math but, on that, but probably but thousands of hours, you know? Oh my God. I mean, there's prep time though. How much prep time yeah. do you think you do for a podcast? I do. I do a couple hours of prep. Yeah. And sometimes more for certain people, but um, and it's a lot. And I'm also with the guest before, with the guest after for a period of time, just connecting and, and having stuff off camera as well. So thousands of hours. By the way, do you always do that? Because I know that is exactly what we did. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, I was, I was going to ask you later what your secret sauce to doing shows is, but I know for me, I will just say this personally. So I've been on, you know, all the shows like you too, like I've done Oprah and the Today Show and uh -huh. CNBC and Fox and you just every single show you can think of I've been on. <clears throat> and when you were kind enough to ask me, uh, I was so generous of you. We met in Puerto Rico, we were having lunch and you knew I had a book coming out in like three weeks. And you're like, Hey man, if you want to come out and do my podcast, I'll squeeze you in before the book comes out. And I was like, can I do it over zoom? And you said, you said, no, man, I'm sorry. You, you can't, you got to come to my studio. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. okay. I literally opened up my phone. I'm like, okay, I'll make changes and I will fly to LA and do your podcast. And I remember saying to my wife, who's upstairs, who was quoting you earlier today. Um, I said, we're going to go to LA and I'm going to go do Lewis House's podcast. And she's like, what? What do you mean we're going to fly to LA for you to do a podcast? You don't even fly to LA to do TV shows in the last 10 years. And, <laughs> and I said, yeah, but I really love this guy. And he's got a, you know, I know his podcasts are fantastic. And um, so I'm going to do it. And when the podcast was done, I came home and she said, how was it? And I was staying in Hollywood Hills, not that far from you. 
And I said, it was one of my top five, top five favorite interviews. Mm. And she said, why? And I was like, because I, first of all, it was Lewis, no entourage, me, no entourage. I showed up at your place with no team. You had one camera person mm. and it was just you and I hanging out talking. We talked before we talked afterwards. And I really felt like I was hanging out with a buddy. And I felt like we, you and I became friends as a result of that. Yeah. Is that part of your secret sauce? Is that experience? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the I think the pre-show is the show. I think that's everything you do before you turn on the actual recording is going to determine how well the show does. You know, and I think of like, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Vegas, to Cirque du Soleil, but they do a great job of creating a show before you get into your seats. You know, they have the performers come out, they connect yes. with you, they engage with you, they like entice you in whatever they're about to do. And I remember watching that when I went to Vegas, I don't know, back in 2008 or something. And I was like, wow, it was actually a performance and a connection before the performance. And it got me excited. It got me really like more engaged and present. And um, I don't know if I took it from that directly, but that's just an example of, I think how people, you know, when they do shows, they just kind of come in and sit down and, and start it. And then they leave. I did this one time where I went on a guy's show, a famous guy who's, you know who he is. And um, I went on a show, he was about 40 minutes late. So I was waiting there in, in, in his studio, in his office, he's 40 minutes late. Uh, we sit down, maybe five, 10 seconds, no, no apology, just like, hey, let's, let's get into it. I hope you're doing well, how's everything, you know, this and that. And then literally we finish and he says, thanks so much for coming on the show, Lewis, and like shakes my hand and like, gets on his phone and walks into his office and I didn't even, he didn't even say goodbye. And I remember just being like, what just happened? And um, was so confused because I was like, that's not the way I try to build relationships and, and add value. And I think it's, you know, again, I didn't feel like I had a lot of value to give growing up because I struggled in school and I was in the bottom of my class. So when I got into kind of my career after professional football and I started going out to networking events and trying to build relationships and using social media to build what I was building online, I, I didn't think I had anything to give because I wasn't, I didn't have a degree yet. I was, you know, not knowledgeable in a lot of things in the business world. So I was just like trying to figure things out. And I was always around people with much, much more skill or talent or experience than me in business. And I just said, I'm going to ask them the most interesting questions. I'm going to be curious about them and I'm going to listen. And I didn't think that was a skill. I just like, uh, I don't know what to say and I don't want to sound ignorant around people. So let me just ask them questions about themselves and not speak at all about myself. And when I would do this, at the end of the night or of an event or a dinner or whatever I was going to, I literally wouldn't say anything about myself. I wouldn't try to act funny or act smart. I would just ask questions and listen. And people would at the end would be like, man, you're like the most interesting guy here. And I was like, I didn't say anything, you know? <laughs> and, and I think That's people right. really like the, the feeling of feeling valued by asking questions, by being interested. And when the more interested you are in people, the more interesting you become and the stronger the relationship you can develop with people. Also true. And, you know, later in your book, there's a part in your book where you quote Dale Carnegie and some of this is in Dale Carnegie, the great you know, guru's book of all time. Um, you have a, I love it. You have a quote at the end of the book, which I wanted to read um, because it's such a beautiful quote and it's at the very end of the book. It's actually on page 301. And the quote is, it gives me chills. If, if people understood the art of falling in love with yourself, the world would be a much better place. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, it's such a beautiful quote because I think <laughs> this book is actually about truly falling in love with yourself, mm -hmm. tapping into who, not only who you are now, but who you really also want to be going forward. Yeah. So you know, let me go to the very beginning of the book for, and let's go right to the top with, with greatness because the book is about the greatness mindset. And, you know, my first thought as I open the book is I wonder what Lewis's definition of greatness is at this point, uh -huh. right? Because I would, I would think that your, your 
definition of greatness has also changed. So tell uh-huh. me today, what is your definition of greatness? Um, it is about discovering your unique gifts and talents uh, and using those unique gifts and talents to pursue your dreams, but in that pursuit, making the maximum impact on the people in your life and the people around you. And so when I grew up, I wanted to be successful and I wanted to accomplish my goals and my dreams. And I would do anything to accomplish them. I would work harder than anyone. I would get up early and train. I would stay up late and do whatever I needed to do. And I was dedicated and committed and consistent. So I didn't lack discipline. I didn't lack goal setting. I didn't lack structure, scheduling. I didn't like finding a team or finding coaches or mentors. Like I was coachable and I would do anything I could to accomplish my goals. But what I realized is that I was chasing success and success alone, I believe is a selfish game. And it wasn't until 10 years ago when I started kind of a healing journey on my own and I started to understand I was doing the wrong things. I realized that success was just never going to be fulfilling enough unless it included other people in a bigger way. And unless literally I could let go of my ego of needing to be right, needing to win at all costs, needing to look good uh, all the time, needing to project an image of perfection or whatever I was doing before. And I realized greatness is really about including your dreams and goals in the service of other people and making sure that it's not about you winning at all costs, but it's about you creating a winning environment for others to win as well. It's not about you being right all the time. It's about you having humility and making sure all voices are heard and seen and acknowledged around you. And again, that's the difference between success and greatness. Success is more selfish for us, which is okay to have if I believe we include others in that mission. And um, so it's definitely evolved over time because my old definition of success did not serve me. It it, it helped me accomplish, but it didn't help me feel fulfilled. And I think that's what we're all looking for. I think that's so interesting what you just said. And now I'm going to jump all the way into chapter. I'm going to jump later into the book. There's a part in the book where you talked about how you pulled your successful friends. And I just found it amazing. I don't know if you remember this part of it, but like you went out and you pulled all your successful friends and you asked them, I think it was about their happiness level before they were successful and after they were successful. And the answer was to me, like, wow. So we want to share that story for a second. Yeah. I started doing this on the show in the last few years. Um, As I would meet people that kind of rose to fame or rose to like, you know, having a bigger platform kind of quickly, you know, they would, they didn't have a following. Then I had a big following within like a number of months or a a year or two, they weren't known. And then they were known and they had more opportunities flooding their way. And I would ask them these questions. I'd be like, we're, you know, on on a scale from one to 10, call it the self-love inner peace scale. Um, Where were you before, right before, like everything started to take off? on that scale. 10 being like, you have a lot of peace, you love yourself, you accept yourself, um, and you just feel really fulfilled inside. And then one being, you know, you hate yourself, you have zero love. And a lot of people were like, you know, I'm a seven or an eight before. And I'd be like, where are you at now? And they're like five or six. And I, and I was like, what? what? It just didn't make sense to me. It did not make sense to me. And I said, why? I said, well, there's a lot more pressure now. There's a lot more like at stake now. I've got to learn how to manage this. I didn't realize how <clears throat> exhausting this could be uh, in certain ways. There, I'm questioning myself at times. I'm just dealing with more things and it makes me feel a little bit more overwhelmed. And it makes sense in some ways because when I was, when I really started to study what holds people back uh, and I was asking everyone for the last 10 years about doubt and the things that held them back from accomplishing what they wanted and feeling what they wanted as well. I I became obsessed with learning about doubt. And I believe self-doubt is the killer of dreams. I think when we doubt ourselves, it's near impossible to accomplish what we want and feel good about ourselves at the same time, just because we're constantly in this loop of insecurity and fear. And I realized that there are three 
main causes of self-doubt, these three fears, the fear of failure, the fear of success, and the fear of judgment, what other people are thinking about us. And I always wanted success, so I wasn't afraid of it. And as an athlete, David, I knew that I needed to fail in order to make success happen. Like it was a thing. Every day you're failing as an athlete, you drop the right. ball constantly, you're missing you're a shot. You're for that. Yeah, you're training and you're, you're constantly making mistakes, but they're not looked at as mistakes. They're just like, okay, we need to make adjustments. It's information, it's feedback. That's what failure was. It was feedback. Okay, this didn't work. Start trying this. Let's do the repetitions. Let's dribble the ball differently. Yep. Let's shoot it differently and practice that until you get the goal. So it was just, it was never like a negative thing to fail. And so that wasn't a fear of mine to fail. And success wasn't a fear of mine either because I wanted it. I was like craving it. You know, there was something inside of me that was missing that was just like, all I'm going to focus on success because it's going to give me the thing that I need to feel good about myself. I'm going to be able to, then I'm going to be able to love and accept myself when I accomplish. We all know that game doesn't work. Uh, but as I started to ask people over the last, you know, 10 years, as I've been studying these fears, I would go to a room and ask people, raise your hand if you've ever been afraid of failure. A lot of people would raise their hand. Most people are afraid of failure. And it's one of the reasons why they don't act. They don't take the action on the thing they want to do, whether they want to launch a book or get into a new relationship or whatever it might be. They're just afraid of failure. And then when I ask people, are you, who here is afraid of success? Almost equal amount of hands would would go up of at least half the room. And I'm and I was always amazed because I was like, but most of you are here because you want to be successful, but you're afraid of success. So if you're afraid of success, why would success come to you? Why would it come into your life when oh, you're essentially resisting success, right? Um, so you're not going to take action. And I started to ask people like, why? Why are you afraid of it? And <clears throat> this kind of response that I was getting from these other peers who are coming on the show, it made sense. They were like, you know, we aren't trained for success. We aren't, we aren't taught how to manage when people come out of the woodwork and ask us for money all of a sudden when we have money, we aren't trained on how to, you know, be in the public eye and, and, and speak effectively without getting criticized constantly and dealing with that type of criticism. We aren't trained with managing the weight, the pressure, or whatever that comes with success. Or, okay, maybe I could get there, but staying successful, that is even scarier for a lot of people. And there's this amazing documentary that I watched a year or two ago called The Weight of Gold. And it's about um, Olympic gold medalists huh. who, commit, who commit suicide a year later or go on antidepressants or overdose or get extremely depressed because of the pressure of being successful and the weight of being an Olympic gold medalist. And can they ever live up to that again? Who are they after that? You know, the identity that someone has, but they, before they weren't successful, now they are. It's a different identity shift of leaning into that and accepting it. So I, I started to understand more and more the pressure and the weight of success for people and why it's a fear. For me, those two things weren't the things that were holding me back from taking action. I was willing to focus. I was willing to be driven, all these things. The third thing crippled me many times in my life, and that was the fear of judgment, the need to please other people, the need to look good and have people like me was the thing that caused a lot of suffering inside of me. And it crippled me for many, many years of my life until about 10 years ago, I started on a healing journey. And it wasn't like it overnight, it was perfect and I was okay and didn't care if people criticized me. It took time to really integrate that healing lesson and, and learn that whenever I do anything, put anything out there into the world, there are gonna be some people that love it and some people that criticize it. Joel Olstein talked about this in the book where he's, you know, he's got one of the largest Christian congregations in, in the world, probably the largest church in America. And I go, man, you, you help a lot of people, but there's also so much negativity around you as a leader and you as a preacher and you and the decisions you make with your church and, you know, the business and the money that you guys have and all these different things that you do. You're just getting criticized constantly. How do you deal with this? 
And he was just like, you know, you're going to get criticized when you, when you're following your path, when you're following your mission, you are yeah. going to be criticized. And <clears throat> he was like, what we need to do as leaders, I'm paraphrasing, is to make sure that we are focused on our lane, focused on our path, not focused on what everyone else is saying about us or criticizing us. Yes, take the feedback and information if it resonates where you need to make improvements and tweaks and adjustments, but don't allow it to don't allow it to get you off of your path and be so worried about everyone else's path. And I think that's hard. That was extremely hard for me. Anytime I got a, a negative tweet or negative comment online back in like 2009, 2010, it's almost like I had to defend myself every time and, and try to get people to like me and, and under, understand me. And people are not going to understand you all the time. And we have to learn to be okay with that. So I had to heal and mend many different wounds that made me be afraid of people questioning me or critiquing me or judging me. And that was the thing that I had to learn the most uh, because at the core of all three of these fears, as you know, David, is I'm not enough. You know, the fear of failure, success, or judgment at the center, the root, if we get to the root, it's I am not enough. I'm not smart enough, talented enough. I'm not, you know, rich enough. I'm not whatever it is, beautiful enough. And this fear, it's insecurity at the root of these things causes us to doubt ourselves, causes us to hesitate, causes us to dim our light. And that's the thing that will not lead to greatness. That's the thing that will lead to suffering, pain, regret, misery, you know, all these other feelings that then get trapped inside of us and hold us back from fully opening our hearts, fully giving of our unique gifts and talents and fully being of service to the people around us because of one of these fears. And when we can learn to create new meaning around the different memories that hurt us from our past, and we can start mending those wounds and creating different meaning, like Viktor Frankl said, man search for meaning. When we can create new meaning, rewrite different stories about the things that cause us to be hurt or feel certain ways or be insecure. And we can say, these things are actually designed for me to overcome. And they help me become more compassionate, more caring, more empathetic, a better listener. All these things that we feel like cause us a lot of pain can bring us a lot of power if we create different meaning around those situations. But that's one of the hardest things for us to do is to go back and reflect and to think about those things and interpret them differently than how we have interpreted them our entire lives and identified with them. But that's the path to freedom and obviously the path to greatness. You know, the, this is a deep book. And actually what you just went through is a deep personal journey that you took to be able to just talk about what you just said. And mm -hmm. I don't want to like say that lightly because as I read through your book, I could see the I could I could experience mm -hmm. the personal spiritual journey that you've gone on and I could feel the growth inside of you. And yet it's not about you. you you've, you're giving this roadmap to other people. And one thing I just want to say to people who are listening, you know, my friends who are listening to this right now is like, sometimes when you hear this concept like greatness and you hear always interviewed all these great people, it, al it almost seems like it's too far away for an ordinary person. And the thing about this, this book, The Greatness Mindset, is that there are nuggets throughout this book that can be applied immediately. And like, I'll just, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm jumping all over the place here, but a couple of nuggets that I wrote down, things that I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use starting tomorrow. One is you have, you have this thing in the book where you call it a thank yourself twice a day. Mm -hmm. Going back to the quote that I gave earlier about self-love, like I'm like, thank yourself twice a day. Like, oh, stop during the day and thank yourself. And you go through specifically <clears throat> like how to thank yourself. And I was like, that's a genius. That's genius to like take a moment twice a day to catch yourself and thank yourself for what you've mm -hmm. done so far today, instead of what yeah. we typically do, which is just beat ourselves up for all the things we didn't get done. And I was like, I'm doing that. You know, you talk about love-based coaching, which I want to jump into in a second, but like, mm -hmm. there's all this, these self-love tools. So realize well, something that just to speak, just to speak into that real quick, you'll, you know, you understand this based on your experience with money. Uh, when you make an investment, 
in something and you add value to it consistently, the value of that investment appreciates and usually appreciates in value right away. You know, if you buy a home and you start to rehab it and you spend four weeks rehabbing it and you add new paint and you add new carpet and you redo the walls and you redo the, the, you know, the doors, whatever it is, and you add new electrical, you're, you're increasing the value of that asset. And it appreciates the moment you increase the value. It, what you appreciate will appreciate in value. And so when you think about ourselves, if you wanted to look at it as an asset yourself, your the mind, ultimate asset. your heart, your spirit, your body, all these things, exactly, you are the asset. If we don't appreciate and pour gratitude, thankfulness, love, good things into us, good thoughts, good self-positive coaching as opposed to negative crit uh, critiquing, if we, if we appreciate ourselves, we will appreciate and value over time. And maybe it doesn't happen right away, but typically when you say something good to yourself or add something good into your body, you feel better instantly as well. And if you do it consistently over time, it will multiply. You know, you'll multiply in appreciation over time. And I just think we've got to look at ourselves differently and, and take care and add value to ourselves differently. And this is not in some narcissistic approach. This is in an approach that is about, again, if it's about success, then it'll never be enough. Is it, if it's about greatness, it's about impacting the people around you. And to go back to what you're saying before, sometimes the word greatness seems so big and so far and so out there. And that's why my definition is not about changing the world. It's about impacting the lives around you. That could be two people. That could be 20 people. That could be when you have the capacity, okay, now it's my community. Now it's my city. Now it's my online platform, whatever it is. When I was broke on my sister's couch, I couldn't think beyond the mission of I need to make money to get off my sister's couch and be able to sustain my life. I wasn't thinking I'm going to change the world and cure cancer. That was not in my mind. It was maybe like a, a dream one day, 20 years away type of thing. But it was like, but I need to get results now. I need to figure out how to get off my sister's couch. I need to figure out how can I make money? I've never made money before. So what am I going to do? I need to find mentors. I need to learn. And I'm in the different season of life where my meaningful mission is about getting off the couch, right? But I still had to impact the people around me. I still had to add value to get a hundred bucks here and there. I had to do something to get value and get money in return to get off the couch. But it was just a smaller community, a smaller group of people that I was impacting in a positive way in order to make that happen. And then as I accomplished that mission, I could reevaluate, okay, I'm in a new season of life. What is my meaningful mission now? And I did that a couple of times until I got to where I'm at today. And um, it's hard to see far if you're dealing with a lot of stress and overwhelm. That's why you've got to learn to take care of yourself first not from a narcissistic point of view, but from a, a true energy point of view to give yourself the skills in order to go beyond that eventually. So that's wanted to make that point. Well, I think it's a really good point too, because for people who don't know your story, Lewis was a professional athlete. And the reason he was on his sister's couch is he was playing arena football. He got it. You got injured and you couldn't play the, the, the thing that you did. You couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. My identity. Your identity, which I want to talk about that next, because so the, here's your identity. You're a young guy. Now you're injured. You, I think you something with your wrist, right? You broke your wrist. Broke my so, wrist. Yep. So now you can't play the sport that was what you were going to do with your life. You're on a couch. You're out of money. You're not feeling good about yourself. There's probably other people listening right now who have got their own version of this. Um, and in the book, you talk about reshaping your identity, right? Because we all go through these periods of time. Like I love the, your story goes on where you, I love the part in the, in the book where you talk about how you, you, you knew this thing about LinkedIn and someone mm -hmm. paid you a hundred dollars because you gave them coaching yep. on LinkedIn, a hundred dollars. And you're like a hundred dollars. And then you built this, like, this online, crazy. Yeah. built this online <clears throat> business, which became a seven figure online business, huge. Mm -hmm. And you had this enormous success with that. So now you're off the couch. You're having online yep. success early. 
you're driving down the 405 freeway. See, I really read the book. And yeah, it's great. And um, you, I think it was on the freeway because I've I've driven on that freeway many times, being uh-huh. going to college in LA. Um, in traffic, where you realize, like, I think it was like people are angry. You're seeing all these people that are angry, and we're we're all stopped in traffic, and everyone was screaming at each other and flipping each other off, you know, around me and honking their horns. And I was like, man, everyone's just stuck, and everyone's feeling angry and they're all upset and I was in a place of like <clears throat> upsetness and stuckness from a relationship and a business partnership and I was getting angry in my life and I go huh this is like a reflection of where I'm at in my life currently I'm accomplishing I made this money I'm achieving I'm getting accolades but why am I still feeling angry why am I still feeling upset why am I feeling stuck in these different relationships and that was kind of the catalyst for me because I was like, oh, something's not working. Like I've been driven to become successful. I'm accomplishing it on my level, on my scale of success in this season. You know, uh, Mark Cuban it would think I'm not accomplishing much from his level, but from my level, I was like, man, this is a lot of money. This is a big deal. Like I'm living in LA, I'm doing these things, but I wasn't happy and I wasn't fulfilled and I felt stuck and I felt trapped and I felt angry and resentful and I had all these mixed emotions. And I go, that is not great. You know, that doesn't feel good to have the things that you wanted, but to not feel the things you wanted. It's like I was physically and environmentally creating what I wanted externally, but I couldn't feel it internally. And I feel like that is, that is almost worse than not having success at all. It's like you chased something, but you still don't feel like you matter, man. That's Mm. that, that was not good. And there's a, there's some type of quote out there. I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's like, there's nothing worse than winning at the wrong things. It's like winning at the thing that you're not supposed to win at. It's like, succeeding and still not feeling a sense of self-love or self-appreciation or gratitude for life or all these things. And I think that was the ultimate like breakdown for me. It was kind of like this, it was shaking me. It's like, wake up. And so I was having these breakdowns everywhere in life. And that's when the journey really began um, where I was like, oh, I'm doing this wrong. But it was so hard to acknowledge that because for so long, the things I was doing was accomplishing results. So it was so hard for me to take a look in the mirror and be like, but this is like the wrong way to go about it. Because we don't want to acknowledge that who we have been, our entity, our identity is no longer working for us. It's not fun to say, oh, my whole life has essentially been a lie. My identity has been a lie. What I thought was a lie. This is like a big, uh, it, it causes like an earthquake inside of us. And it's not fun to realize that. So we want to go back to our old way of being and just work harder and not face it. And I was just sick and tired of it. And so I, I needed to face it. And that's when the journey of, of healing really began. So it was so interesting too about when we talk about identity, right? Because I think one of the things I, I, I learned going through the book is the idea that you can pursue something that's an identity thing. And our identities over time our, we, we should allow ourselves to change our identity. And this is not just mm-hmm. a career thing, right? Like you, you have p- parents who've, who've dedicated their life to being a parent. And I'm, I'm going through this partially right now. I've got one of my kids has gone off to college. And, mm-hmm. you know, all of a sudden it's like, well, wait a minute. Like I, I, I was Mr. Dad and now I'm, I'm, now I'm half Mr. Dad, right? Like, the, like every, there's just so many versions of this. People are married then. They're not married. Like, they, you know, you are married and you lose a spouse. Like, like our, our, our identities through life evolve and yet we're not trained for them to evolve. And I think what you did in the book beautifully was sort of lay out um, how to reshape your identity. And you talk about in the book, you know, if you're unhappy with your identity right now, here's what you can do to change your identity. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because I think it's so powerful. I think think a lot of it is getting clear on your your meaningful mission and seeing this is fully aligned with who you want to be, either where you are now and who you want to step into. I think when you get clear on what is the season of life that I'm in, like you're in a season of life where you were a dad for 
20 years, essentially full time dad. Now you're still a full time dad with part time responsibilities, right? It's like yeah. he's off to college and you're he checks in when he wants to when he wants money or whatever it is. And um, wait, are you so, seeing my WhatsApp messages? Because that's exactly what's <laughs> happening. <laughs> hey, dad, can you Venmo me? Yeah. Hey, dad, I need a trip. I need this. Yeah. And you're like, okay, now I'm just back to a, like a bank again. Um, Cause that's how I was with my dad. It was, you know, we all do the same thing. And so <clears throat> I think you just got to know what's my season. Okay. Here's my season and, and really get clear on a meaningful mission. And that might take some time to develop and figure out by testing and trying different things that work for you. And maybe the, the mission is I'm in a season of exploration. I'm in a season of, rediscovering and reinventing and, and learning new things. And, and that's going to be my mission. It's not some end goal. It's just being open to seeing what this season is going to be. And so once we get clear on that, though, I feel like then we can lean into, okay, what are the things I need to overcome? And, and usually, and also what are the talents I need to step into for this season? Uh, and in order to find kind of the, the mission, I think about the, the three P's. It's the, the passions, the power, and the problem you're looking to solve. And the passions are the things you're curious about, your interests. And I've heard people say, like, don't follow your passion. Follow, like, where you can make the most money or where the profit is and just the thing you're good at. But I think when we are curious about something and we are interested in something, we will pay more attention to it and we'll actually get better results and we'll be more sustainable in our energy towards it. So I think when we are able to pursue something we're interested in and we don't always have that opportunity, you know, I was a truck driver for many months. I did all these other odd jobs when I was just trying to make money. I wasn't able to pursue these things because I was trying to just survive at that time. But if we're in a season of choosing, and we are able to really get curious about your interests. And that's the first P. The second, and that, and that might be trying a bunch of different things to see what you're interested in. The second one is the power and also the things that make you powerless. And so figuring out what are these skills and assets that you do have, and, and they might be invisible. They might be invisible skills and assets that you don't think are powerful. I didn't think being in the bottom of my class was an asset. I didn't think not feeling smart was an asset. I didn't think not having anything interesting to say about me was an asset. But because it was something that made me feel powerless, I learned how to make it a superpower. I learned how to go all in on my fears of public speaking and, and learning and reading and writing and all these different things that I was afraid of. I learned how to go all in on the things that made me powerless and they eventually made me become very powerful. You know, I never thought that I would speak in front of stages of 10,000, so 20,000 and make, and make six multiple six figures for 60 minutes because I couldn't stand in front of a classroom of people without feeling insecure or without feeling like I'm getting laughed at or without feeling like I'm stuttering. And that was something that made me feel powerless today it's a superpower and it's the thing that I constantly work on and improving a skill set. And so I never thought that you could ask questions and make money and you know, be a top show because you felt insecure and you just want to learn. I didn't think that was an asset or a skill set that could be part of my mission. So be, be curious about the invisible assets that you have and the invisible skills as well. Um, so that's, Going all in on things that make you feel your fears, the things that make you feel powerless, so they become a superpower, leaning into those. And then the third thing is figuring out what problem you want to solve. I think every mission needs to have something you're looking to solve. And I think we are more creative and more focused when there is a problem that we're trying to overcome. I think, um, you know, a couple of examples of that is, you know, when, when our veterans come home from a mission and they have no mission next and they're mm. done with their with their time completely it's just like go back to your go back to normal life and your mission's complete oh, you see a lot of these men and women struggling in life and thankfully there's a lot of great programs that help them re reclaim new goals and their identity now that they're not in this season of service with the military 
and you see a lot of them struggling with mental health issues or overdoses or depression or whatever it might be because there's no meaningful mission that they're on right now. And we've got to get back to some meaning uh, uh, of our mission as soon as we can. When the identity shifts, when we go through divorce, when you, you know, have a near-death experience, when you lose your career, whatever it might be, when the economy crashes, when COVID happens, like we've got to get clear on a meaningful mission. Otherwise, we're gonna be much more destructive of ourselves and the people around us in a negative way. And that's why so, the third thing, the third thing is finding a problem that you want to solve. And my friend Rory Vaden, I'm not sure if you know Rory, but uh, I, I do know Rory because we've actually had Rory speak at our at AA Wealth Management oh, at Advisors Excel. He's great. Yeah, he gave a great quote one time that said, "We are, we are, per you are perfectly positioned to help the person you once were." And I think it's so true. If you were financially poor and you learned how to make money and become prosperous, you are perfectly positioned to help someone right now who is poor. If you've lost 50 or 100 pounds and you've gotten the best shape of your life and you struggled for your whole life, you're perfectly positioned to help someone who's in that state that you were five, 10 years ago. And I think finding ways to solve the problems that fulfill you. There's lots of problems in the world and you can't solve all of them, but find things that are close to you that will give you more sustainable energy to serve. And I think that's part of the process of the identity as well. So, so I just want to remind people, the book is The Greatest Mindset. Unlock the power of your mind and live your best life today. You're listening to Lewis Howes. Um, and I'll just give you an example of how this book impacted me today. And and it's such, you know, I, I'm, I'm, we're interviewing this today. Your book's coming out in March. We're doing this interview in advance of your of your book coming out. Um, and it's January 31st as I record this. It's probably not what you're supposed to do when you do recording is mention the date that you recorded it. But there's a reason <laughs> I want to mention it because I've always been a big goal setter. In fact, if you look off to the right of me, you'll laugh. But uh, I have Jetsy Itzler's calendar sitting over here. Uh, oh, I love it. He's awesome. And so I, I've got his I've got his. Uh, big ass calendar sitting next to me here. I, I have my entire months map, you know, my months mapped out because I love Jesse and and he's got such great programs. And um, I made an identity shift. This is before I read your book. I made an identity shift in the beginning of January, which is actually why I ended up reaching out to you about something else. And uh -huh. what I realized, in, I, I've gone through a lot of health challenges the last two years, and you know about some of them. Like, I mean, I've had an ankle replacement. Now I've had a, my, my listeners don't know, but I tore my rotator cuff. I, I went skiing again, tore my rotator cuff. I almost died last year. I can say this laughing, but I got meningitis. Um, I, I spent 22 days in the hospital last year. And I so, know. you know, going through that, as I laid out, well, what are, what are my, what are my mission and my goals and what I want for this year? I decided that unlike how I normally do my goals, I was going to focus on my identity and that what I wanted mm. to do is I wanted to focus on my identity that I want to be a healthy person. I want to be not do, I want to be healthier for now and for my future. And I've been going through the personal discovery process of what do I need to change in my life? What do I need to take away? And what do I need to add to be that person? Not to look like that person, not to like, oh, I want to lose 10 pounds. And, you know, what do I want to be inside? One of the reasons I reached out to you about mm -hmm. Joe Dispenza, which you've done so many inter amazing interviews with Joe Dispenza. And thanks to you, I signed mm -hmm. up to go to his program in April. Yeah. Is a part of that journey of, of identity shift to, to, focus on being healthy. And what I realized reading your book is like, the, there were so many things. I mean, I know this stuff, but it's like the reminders, like, oh, right. Like, I don't actually know everything about how to be healthy. I have to still go out and hire people to coach me yeah. on being healthier. I need to go out and continue to listen to a zillion of your more of your podcasts on mm -hmm. health. Um, but I think that the, the key is, and you read through your book, and I just want to say this because a lot of the stuff we've talked about, it seems really they're big ideas, but what you did in the book is you created a roadmap. So throughout the chapters, there are exercises, like when you talk about meaningful mission, you lay out how to figure out your meaningful mission. You have tools throughout the book to do the work. And I, I really salute you for that because as, as, as I was reading the book, I thought to myself, this was not a fast, fast book to write. 
And later in the book, you mentioned <laughs> that there was a point in this book in which it was taking you longer than you wanted it to, but you just decided, okay, I'm not going to be a perfectionist, but I'm going to keep working on this book until I feel like it's done. And, uh, you know, you did the work. So I salute you for that. Yeah. Thank you. you. I, I, I want to ask you a couple, because you, you spent a lot of time on therapy. You wrote a book called The Mask mm -hmm. of Masculinity. And yeah. you went on a journey of intentional therapy. And you've done a lot of intentional therapy around relationships. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a, I'm going a little bit off track, but it's straight out of your book here. You talk about, this was because I have this underlined, and I thought this was such a big thing. I wanted to share it. You said, and this is somebody else's quote, I believe, but narcissists often go undiagnosed because they refuse therapy yeah that's what uh dr uh um romani said and she's like a, a therapist expert on narcissism and she's like she said she thinks in la it's 25 percent of people in la are, are narcissists and it's probably like 15 percent around the world 10 to 15 percent around the world but in la even more intensified because of the industries that are here but most of it, you can't diagnose because they won't even come in and say, hey, can you help me with anything? Because um, it's just, that's not what they're willing to do. They'll never say there's something wrong with me. Right. It's always about other people. And you talk about the fact that you had multiple girlfriends. We won't call out who they were, but you had multiple girlfriends yeah. that you actually asked, said, I want to go to therapy with you. And they wouldn't and they didn't go. want to. They want to do it. <laughs> and now you're in a relationship yeah. where you, you talk about, because this is all public, and you talk about the fact that you started your relationship in therapy. And started, I was like, we, we what both, a freaking yeah, grown up this guy is. <laughs> well, I mean, I think you go through enough suffering and you make enough mistakes. At least for me, I was like, I'm, I don't want to make the same mistakes anymore. And I think it, sometimes it takes a lot of repeating pain or health issue over and over and over again for us to say, okay. No more or credit card and bankruptcy over and over and over again. <laughs> right. We're like, okay, I've got to no get more. my stuff in order in this area of my life. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to keep repeating this pattern. You, you start to say, I'm the common denominator in all these instances in the last 15 years. What can I do? Uh, and what do I need to shift? And uh, for me, it was about you know healing. It was about healing because I was I was attracting from a wound. I was staying in relationships based on a wounds. Um, and, and I hadn't healed and mended those wounds and I create, hadn't created new meaning from different past memories. And so I needed to do that. And I need to allow my body emotionally to heal because I still had insecurity. I still had like this need to people, please the person I was with. And that means I would change my identity when they didn't like my identity. I would change my way of being habits, routines, actions. If they didn't like something and if they wanted to scream or react and i was just like okay i'll do whatever to make you happy I'll, I'll, i just wanted peace but you can't buy peace you must be peace and so i wasn't able to create boundaries because i was afraid and so i would give in and give in who i was who my values were my vision were to make one person happy and in that process i was being miserable in the process i was unfulfilled because I was giving up my identity for one person and they were never happy with me, no matter how much I would adjust or shift or change. Now, I don't blame any of these people that I was with. This was their wound that I attracted based on a wound that I had. And this is their pattern and their behavioral pattern based on making themselves feel safe and protected with what they had going on. It was my choice to stay in these relationships. And so I had to take a look in the mirror and say, why was I staying? Why would I stay when I'd be treated certain ways? that weren't acceptable to me. What was in me that didn't feel enough that I would stay? And so I had to really take a, a deep look and I was just like, you know, I wanna be single for as long as I can or I'll be single for the rest of my life if I have to be to, to stay peaceful and be peaceful inside and not allow myself to be treated in certain ways that are against my values and my vision and my lifestyle. And um, I, I found an emotional coach that I said, I'm going all in. You tell me anything to do. I'll come here every week. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll stay as long as it takes. I want to be free inside. I want to mm. be peaceful inside. I want to be clear inside. And I spent five months every week with an emotional coach, sometimes five hours at a time on Saturdays, just diving in, diving in, 
saying, okay, let's go farther. Let's go farther. What's it going to take? And so there was a moment that I had, I kind of had like chest pains off and on for the last, I don't know, 20 years of my life. Not like, it was like a ball of pain. It's kind of like this ball of pain. And there was a moment where all of this kind of reflection, practice, integration, and then doing it in the real world, in the relationship, because I was still in the relationship when I was doing this. I was like, okay, I'm going to practice this while these things come up. I'm going to integrate it. Then I'm going to reflect on it every week. Practice, integrate, reflect week after week for five months. Facing the fear, facing the emotional insecurity, facing the, the chaos, facing it. And saying, what would the ultimate version of me be able to do? How can I manage this better? How can I respond better? And there was a moment in this emotional coaching and this therapy where it all clicked. It took a long time to get there, but it was a moment of freedom. It was a moment of finally like realizing. And a lot of it was, I felt like if I was... I was afraid to be trapped in a relationship. I was afraid that to repeat a pattern that my parents had where they were essentially trapped for 30 years and both of them weren't happy in the relationship. And it, and it caused a lot of pain with us kids to witness their model of relationship. We knew they loved us. You know, they did activities with us and showed affection and loved us, but they didn't love each other. And so we watched their stress we watched their lack of love, their lack of affection, their, their pulling away. We watched their cold shoulders. We watched their silent treatments for weeks. We, we watched the arguments. And I was just like so afraid of recreating that um, that I felt like I was going to be trapped. And so I got to a place where I realized I'm not trapped. And it all came down to like being judged, the fear of judgment. Because, well, what happens if I'm trapped? And then what happens in 20 years, I'm miserable. And then what happens if um, I get divorced? And then I'm, and then everyone judges me and criticizes me. And then I'm trapped again. And so I had to like just go through the deepest fears that I had until I felt like it was kind of like the Goodwill Hunting moment. I don't know if you remember the movie Goodwill Hunting, um, one of my favorite movies. I love that movie. Robin Williams is like, it's not your fault. Huh. I totally fault. remember that. It's not your fault. And he's like, yeah, fault. I know. He's like, no, it's not, your fault. it's not your fault. And he just kept doing it right mm. over and over again until he like realized it wasn't his fault. And it wasn't that exact moment or scene, but it was like, she was like, Lewis, you're not trapped. You're not trapped. You're not you're trapped. a free man. <laughs> you're not trapped. You're a free man. And I was just like, it, somehow like it just finally wow. connected in my body or my nervous system or my heart or everything combined it was like this i had this ball of pain in my chest and it literally in a moment disintegrated and i felt it like just kind of disintegrate and go throughout my whole body i don't know what that is or what it was like it's hard to explain it and it felt so weird because my whole body was tingling and i was just like what just, I was kind of like confused. I was like, what just happened? I felt this pain my whole life essentially, and now it's gone. And I was kind of like wondering if it was going to come back, and it hasn't come back. And that was you know, almost two years ago. It's amazing. And, and, um, and by the way, and the, you and know, the reason why it has, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just saying the reason why, why I believe it hasn't come back is because I continued with the emotional coaching every two weeks for the last two years. I said, okay. I, just because this happened, I'm not like done and let me wash, wash my hands and go back to life. I said, I want more. I want to keep integrating this. I want to keep diving in because we do have PTSD and we, we, we are so good at going back to the familiar that we must break through that over and over again. We must overcome the old identity consistently until it really is a new identity, until that's so unfamiliar, the past self that it's not even a thought that we would go back to. And that usually doesn't happen overnight. That is reflection, practice, and integration, and then more reflection, practice, and integration consistently over time. And I feel really great at this stage. And because I feel great, I keep showing up. You know, the greatest athletes uh, of all time, when they win the championship, they don't stop saying, you know, 
thanks coach for getting me here. I don't need you to coach me anymore. I got this on my own. I'm going to just do this on my own for the, and I'm going to win the next championship. They go hire more coaches at different areas of their skill set training to get them to the next level as well and stay there. And so I was like, I got to keep investing in the coaching, keep investing in the practice, keep investing in the support because life will happen. And as new pressures arise, we don't want to fall back into old identities. I think also for people listening, you know, who do know about all your success, it's impressive to hear the level of work you've done on yourself. And I think it's a testament to the fact the way the best get better is they keep working on themselves. And for someone who's listening to this and maybe they're going through these similar types of struggles, um, I I thought this was super interesting. And I I literally highlighted this in the book. You taught, and I don't know if this is the same therapist or not. You said your therapist asked you three things. What is your intention for therapy? Yes. Profound. What do you Mm -hmm. want? And then uh, over time, she would ask you, have you found it? And I was like, yeah. whoa, he found a really good therapist because mm-hmm. I don't think most therapists ever ask those questions. And so I think if someone's going I'm, to therapy, yeah. they should be thinking through these questions. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. And every time I would go, so the first meeting I met her, she goes, what's your intention? She asked me these questions. And I said, she said, what do you want? Right? And I said, I want peace. I want freedom. And I want clarity. And every time I meet with her, the first thing she should say, what's your intention? What do you want? Peace, freedom, clarity. And so we worked on what was at the root of me not feeling peaceful, me not feeling clear and not feeling free. And it's not something you can buy. You must be it. And I was trying to buy peace by giving in who I was to make some other people happy. And you're not always going to make people happy. And what I learned is like, okay, I wasn't fully accepting myself. And therefore, I would give in to try to create peace because I wasn't able to be stable under chaos. It was uncomfortable for me. So I had to learn that. But I was also like, I want to create a relationship in an environment that is peace, where both accept each other individually and accept ourselves as well, the other person. And I was like, that's my vision. And I realized, okay, the relationship I'm in, this person does not want to accept me for who I am. And so it's time to end it. You know, after many months of this practice, I was like, okay, it's time for me to walk away and face a greater fear. The greater fear that this person might talk crap about me or they're going to hate me or they're going to do this, which was another fear of mine, which I didn't want. And all those things happened. And so I had to learn how to just face it and embrace it and say, okay, yeah. And this is what it's going to take. It's going to take me overcoming this fear by experiencing it. Not by analyzing it, but by actually going through it. And it's one of the hardest things to do because we don't like those feelings. Mm. Powerful, powerful stuff. There's a, there, you know, jumping again, I, I've jumped all over this book, but there's so much in this book to talk about. There's a quote from Lindsay Vaughn. Uh, I love Lindsay Vaughn, but she's, you know, obviously one of the greatest skiers of, of life. And I actually channel Lindsay Vaughn because Lindsay Vaughn, if anybody's a ski fanatic or yeah. watches ski racing, um, Lindsay Vaughn has been some of the through the most some of the most horrific ski accidents I've ever seen, uh-huh. and has managed to re- rehabilitate herself over and over and over again, and throw herself back down the mountain at record speeds. And I actually channel; she doesn't know me, but I channel her when I go to physical therapy four days a week. That's great. And like, what would Lindsay Vaughn do? <laughs> you know, she would not That's be great. complaining; she would be working harder. And she's got a quote in the end of the book where you said, "She says, I honestly feel the most successful people." aren't the most talented. They're not the smartest. They're the people that are willing to go the extra mile that other people are not. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it makes the hair on my arm want to stand up. But like when I, I think that that quote, you know, can apply to so many elements of our life. Like you've just done a deep dive on what you did personally from a relationship standpoint, you, you pursued greatness in your relationships. Yes. And what could be more meaningful? And and again, I think for somebody who's listening, maybe if they don't even have their own, they don't have their own business, but there's always elements in our life where we can pursue greatness. And I just really hope that my listeners will go and get a copy of The Greatness Mindset. You guys, go listen to Lewis Howe's podcast. It's embarrassing when I think that this guy, I've done like 30 podcasts and Lewis has 1,200 um, you, you, you know, when I think about how much money I spend for my kid to go to college right now at Northwestern, 
<laughs> and there's 1200 hours of pot more than that of lewis's podcast it's like the ultimate school of greatness you got to go check out his podcast i have a few questions i want to ask though before i say goodbye yeah. and you know you always end your podcast with a certain with three certain questions and i want to i want to throw those questions to you um perfect now having done 1200 podcasts by the way I think you spent at least ten thousand hours on on your craft. Maybe it's ten thousand, yeah. And, Maybe and it it's not thousands; it's ten, probably ten thousand or more. Um, you know, studying greatness, interviewing the greatest people of our lifetime, doing all the deep work yourself. Um, you know, God forbid if something was to happen to you, and you were to leave, three life lessons for the world, or you know, if you had children, yeah. or your niece, or your nephew, or my kids. What would be Lewis's three lessons he wants to leave behind? Oh, uh, I think the first one would be learn to fully love and accept yourself for who you are and also be committed to growing every day into who you want to become. That would be the first one, um, because I think a lot of people don't learn how to love themselves and how to accept the things that have happened in their life. And, and, and I also don't think you're ever finished. It's like, yes, accept who you are, but also be working to improve and grow um, because you want to make a bigger impact. So that'd be step one truth and lesson number one the second one would be and i think that includes like you're you're working on your health your emotions and all these areas of your life so i'm going to add that into that that first lesson uh the second lesson would be to practice gratitude every single day as often as you can. I'm a big believer that gratitude is the gateway to abundance. It is the door to open up new possibilities, more love, more joy, more financial freedom, um, and, ex and beautiful experiences when we are in gratitude and a state of gratitude as often as possible. And the third one would be Make sure whatever you're doing, do it also in the service of other people. You see me taking notes. Um, I, I think those are three beautiful things. And I, I love the fact that you've asked this question probably a thousand times, but it felt like this might have been the first time you've actually deeply thought about <laughs> it for yourself. Um, <laughs> And I appreciate that you just really took the time to like go inside and think about it. I, I am grateful to you, Lewis. You are you are a phenomenal mm. human being. I feel honored to, to have call you a friend. You know, be able to text back and forth, um, share your book with the world. You're going to help so many people with this book. You've already helped so many people with your work, and I just I salute you. Uh, and I thank you for for who you are and who you show up on it on a day to day basis. You're just a gift. So God bless you, my friend. Everybody, go Thanks, check David. out Lewis. You're welcome. Go check out LewisHouse.com. And I know you're sp LewisHouse.com backslash bundle is yep. is where all the details on his book offers are, and you'll be able to find the greatness mindset. I know everywhere this will be on all the bestseller lists. I know everybody's going to be interviewing you. And I'm I'm also glad I probably got. To, am I one of your first interviews? Out of curiosity, how many of these have you done so far? <clears throat> well, I just started the first week of January, and I'm doing two to three a day. So okay. you're probably like probably like the first twenty percent of interviews that I'm doing. I, well, I feel like I got you first. I feel like you're very very fresh. And, I am um, fresh. You know, you, you, you it was fresh. just a, it was just a serious gift. So. Good luck. Yes. Take care of yourself during this Thank time you. because it's a lot of hard work prepping up the book launch. I know. Keep your health up and um, just know that if you ever need anything, I'm here for you. Come visit me in Italy. I, I, it's an open invitation yes. and I'll keep you posted on how I do uh, with Joe Dispenza's conference in April. Let me know.
It's okay. amazing. Let me know. Thanks, I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Good seeing you, buddy.